Good afternoon to all of you that are joining us on this on this Good Friday service. You know, as we have been talking about all week, the events of this week, Passion Week as we call it, were some of the most important days on the calendar from creation, frankly, until now, but certainly up until the, until the time of that week. And I trust that you have been reflecting on the things that were going on, on the, on the events that we've been trying to remind ourselves of. And certainly today we come to the, maybe the most somber, the most serious day again ever on the calendar, the day that the Son of God died on a cross for sinners like us. Today, we're going to do our best <clears throat> to keep this to maybe 45 minutes or less. It will be 45 minutes or less, but I just, because I know it's going to be a little more because we have a lot to do. We need to go back and just review a bit. So I want you to pray with me, and we need to basically just jump right in. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, I thank you for the times of our of our Bible studies that we've been able to have uh, ever since this quarantining and shelter in place, we've been able to gather together around our screens, our computers, our phones, our tablets, or however we're viewing these, and we've been able to spend some time in your word. And Father, this particular week, it's been wonderful to be able to join together with others to to dig into your word, to be reminded of, of events and, frankly, theology that we've all known for a long time, most of us. And yet, sometimes, like the disciples, it had become just ritual. It Sometimes our theology just became head knowledge. I do pray that you'll touch our hearts today, that we will not just go through a, lo a litany of of historical words and historical events. But Father, cause us to think about it from our heart as well as our head. Oh, how I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I mean, again, where do I begin? I said to you the other day that that years ago that there were churches that would gather usually at noon on a, on Good Friday and They'd bring in seven preachers to, to be able to each one talk about and bring a short message on one of the seven last sayings of Christ. I had the privilege of participating in one of those when we were at Trinity back 40 plus years ago now, <clears throat> and it was a wonderful opportunity. But can you imagine gathering seven preachers to be able <laughs> to try to look at seven passages? I mean... We were all told we had 15 minutes. I had a speaker one time many, many years ago, and he said, how long do you want me to take? And I said, well, how about if you, if I, if I give you like 20 minutes? And he said, that's good. If you give me 20 minutes and I take 20 minutes, that's 40. So that'll be perfect. Well, I saw one of my friends from the Philippines uh, down in Davao, and his church was doing a Good Friday service, and they had seven preachers, and it said each would speak for 15 minutes. And I thought, mm hmm, sure. Well, this morning, this afternoon, excuse me, we're going to do our best. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to open with me to, to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is how we are going to try to walk through this final day in the life of Jesus Christ. In which he was, uh, in which he was arrested, and tried, and convicted, and crucified, and buried, and we're going to have to go to some other passages, or at least reference other passages, because John doesn't do it all. But in John chapter eighteen, and beginning at verse two, it said, "Now Judas, who was betraying him." knew the place, for Jesus had often met there 
with his disciples. Met where? The Garden of Gethsemane. You and I recognize that the gospel records do not contain every event, every word, every miracle that Jesus ever did. In fact, it's John who will say at the end of his gospel, the whole world couldn't contain everything. So we don't know all the times that Jesus met at the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, but what we do know, it was enough times that when Judas tried to figure out where Jesus would be, the first thought was, oh, I'll bet he'll be in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now again, please keep reminding yourself, it wasn't because Judas thought, oh, this was his last day. He was praying because he was going to be crucified and die and blood. He didn't know that. He knew that he had betrayed him. He knew that he had set a plan in motion that Jesus was going to be arrested. He knew that. And he probably understood where it was going to go, but Judas came to the garden. So what I want to do is just very quickly talk about the background, as it were, to Golgotha, or if you will, on the way to Golgotha. You'll recall that when Judas arrived, it was probably midnight or maybe a little beyond. So that's why it was probably, well, it was already Friday by the by the Jewish reckoning of time, but for us, it was Friday. It was after midnight, and Judas arrived. It was late. It was dark, and I said, I believe yesterday, that when Judas arrived, I mean, that's why the, 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 the soldiers came with their, with their torches, and they arrested Jesus. They knew who he was because of the betrayer's kiss. Well, we don't have time this morning to look back at such things, but I want to remind you that Jesus had five different trials. He was tried before Annas. He was tried before Caiaphas. He was tried before the Sanhedrin. He was tried, of course, before Pilate. And in the midst of that trial, he was sent off to Herod. The reality is, especially Annas and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, they were for sure illegal trials because they were being held before dawn. They were illegal. They should have never happened. And we all know the story. They tried to find witnesses who would lie about things. I mean, it was a travesty. It was a, it was a unjust justice. Well, I need you to remember about Pilate. What, a, what an interesting historical character. If you ever traveled to Israel with us, you and I would stand on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea at a place called Caesarea. Do you know that the, the, the people who don't really believe the Bible, the liberals, as it were, they have tried for generations to discount the Bible and discredit the Bible. I mean, they have pulled all kinds of things. They claim people who are mentioned in the Bible don't exist, uh, like Darius the Mede, for instance, in the Old Testament. But one of the people they locked in on was Pilate. They said there's no record of Pilate in the Roman histories or in the Jewish histories. He never existed. And they could say that with pretty confident voices because his name didn't appear in any of those records. But it appeared in the inspired record, so those of us that believe the Bible believed he existed. Well, a few years back, an archaeologist turned over a rock, and on the rock it said, Pontius Pilate. So finally, the record was, was, um, was made to be clear. Pilate did exist. Those of us that believe the Bible, we didn't need that rock. We had the Bible. But nevertheless, Pilate was a historical person. He was not really well liked by the Jews, of course, but they brought Jesus to him that morning. In fact, in, in the record, it says early in the morning, probably somewhere after uh, sunrise, maybe maybe 7 o'clock or maybe 8 o'clock at the, really at the latest. And he stood before Jesus as his, he thought at least, as his judge and jury. We all know the series of questions that Pilate asked. The most probing was, of course, his question, what is truth? We have people today still looking for truth. 
People still wondering, where do I find truth? Who is truth? What is truth? And as it's been said so many times, standing in front of him was truth incarnate. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But Pilate's eyes were blinded. He was spiritually dead. He didn't recognize who this man was. John, the apostle, loves a particular word in his gospel records. I would encourage you to do a little Bible study on these. And here's the word, behold. Behold. Remember in John chapter 1, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Well, Pilate said at least twice in this in his trial with Jesus. One time he said, Behold the man, eke homo, as it's been said. Behold the man. And then once the trial was over, he said, Behold your king. You remember at that point, the Jews responded and reacted really negatively. He said, he's not our king. We have no king, say it, but Caesar. They were willing to say that this wicked, pagan, absolutely godless ruler of the Roman Empire was actually their king, discounting Jehovah God as their king, certainly discounting Yeshua, Jesus, as their king. Pilate didn't want to do what he did. He tried, and I think it's five times he said, I find no fault in this man. He didn't. He found no fault. Remember his wife? His wife came to him and said, don't have anything to do with this. Well, he was tried and convicted. We all know the story. Pilate finally thinking he could get out of this said, okay, I'll tell you what, I have this, this rebel, this robber, this this rebellious one named Barabbas. How about if I give him to you, or do, would you rather have Jesus? Well, he assumed in his heart that they would have wanted Jesus. He fed them and taught them and healed them, and Barabbas robbed them. And But the crowd said, give us Barabbas. And then Pilate made this statement. A statement that every one of you watching today need to ask and answer. Here was his question. What shall I do then with Jesus? What shall I do with Jesus? Oh, there are so many people in our, in our country right now today who go through Good Friday, never even think one iota about Jesus. They don't think about him on Thursday. They won't think about him tomorrow. They certainly won't think about him even on Easter what shall I do with Jesus? You remember the answer, right? Crucify him. They led him away after the beating and the scourging. They led him away to the place of Golgotha, to the place of the skull, to this public crucifixion spot. You remember that there were two other criminals that were that were taken along with Jesus. Of course, there were to be three crucified on that hill that day. There were always to be, there was always to be three, but the third was never to be Jesus. It was to be Barabbas. I suspect these other two criminals were in cahoots with Barabbas. I suspect they were, they were compadres, as it were, in criminal activity. And they watched their friend Barabbas go free while they were led to Golgotha. They took Jesus and they took his holy hands and they nailed them to a cross. They took his gracious feet that had walked all over Israel and up and down the, the, the land, healing and teaching and feeding. They took those feet and nailed them to a cross. And then they put him up with a, with a statement on it. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You know, I have heard preachers and I have read accounts and books of graphic detail about crucifixion. You know, I find it interesting that Nowhere that I read in the New Testament 
Does any New Testament writer go into graphic detail about the crucifixion? Oh, I understand that in the first century when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote, people were very familiar with crucifixion. So when it says they crucified Jesus, they had a mental picture in their mind. But folks, I, I think it's deeper than that. God knew that you and I in the 21st century would be reading these passages and we would have no personal interaction with crucifixion. So if God had wanted, he could have had the writers go crucifixion and then go on for a paragraph as to what it was. Today, we're not going to, we're not going to go into detail about what crucifixion was, how it took place. We're not going to ask ourselves, did they lift it up, drop it? We're not... To me, those are all things to the side. They're fun for theologians to discuss. Maybe, they're, maybe they would be interesting for us if we were sitting in a room and we could talk about such things. But for today, I want you to do what Pilate said. Behold the man. I want us to stand at the foot of the cross this, mor this afternoon. Please excuse me if I say this morning, but... I want us to stand at the foot of the cross and I want us to listen. The gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record seven statements that Jesus made from the cross. Seven, as, as writers and preachers have said for generations, the seven last sayings of Christ. Statement number one. Listen to it now. He's hanging on the cross. He's been nailed to the cross. An innocent for the guilty. And the first statement out of the lips of Jesus was this. Luke records it in Luke chapter 23. And he says this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Isn't it interesting? He didn't say they don't know who I am. He said, they don't know what they're doing. The sin of ignorance, literally the, the sin of blindness, Pilate and the Jewish leadership and those who were in the crowd crying, crucify him, they demonstrated that they were ignorant and blind spiritually. In fact, Paul will say later in, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, if they had known that he was the king of glory, they wouldn't have crucified him. But they did. I want you to notice the first word in that statement, Father. See, Jesus was in close connection with his heavenly Father. And he said to forgive them. It wasn't some just blanket forgiveness in the sense that that they did, they don't hold responsibility or culpability per se but he talked to them about praying for their enemies remember he said that in Matthew chapter 5 pray for your enemies pray for those who despitefully use you Jesus was a man of prayer we know that garden of gethsemane that's where Judas said he'd find him on the cross, the first word is a prayer. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. But I need you to move to statement number two. Statement number two is also found in the Gospel of Luke. Statement number two is a statement to forgiveness. If statement number one was, the, was a word of forgiveness, statement number two is a word of salvation. Do you remember we... We said about it, and you, most of you are watching this. You, you know this story so well. There were two thieves that were crucified on either side of Jesus. And the gospel records are very clear. They mocked and jeered like everyone else. I mean, they didn't have any more love or concern for this innocent one dying than they did for themselves. They threw their, their hateful and spiteful words at Jesus until something happened in the heart of one of them. Oh, how I wish, if I wish the gospel records would have gone into 
greater detail about something, that's what I wish that they had gone into detail on. I would love to know what was it that, that this criminal heard? What was it that this criminal saw? What was it that changed his heart? I mean, certainly we know in the, in the greater scheme of things, it was God's grace. We get that because that man said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Oh, a statement of faith, a statement of salvation, a statement of recognizing that he was a sinner and he needed a savior. And he recognized that that one on the middle cross was somebody different than Barabbas, somebody different than them. And Jesus' second statement was, today you will be with me in paradise. Were the other two criminals Jewish? I'm not really sure I know. If they were Jewish, they would have had some idea of that word paradise, Abraham's bosom. There was this Kind of, the Old Testament doesn't speak really a lot about what happens to the person that dies, but he would have understood this, that when he died, he would be with this Jesus, Yeshua, the Savior. Oh, you want to know the word of hope in that statement? When Jesus said, today. Most of you understand that crucifixion was, again, one of the worst uh, deaths ever conceived by man. And, and there, were, there are stories that people crucified could have lasted three to five, this upwards to seven days on the cross. That suffering and pain would just go on and on. But for this man, he heard the words today. He knew that he would die today, which I think if you were on the cross, you would take that as a sign of hope. From sinner to saint, do you understand that most of us will die like we live? What do I mean by that? You know, if you live a life of unbelief, you live a life of rejection of anything to do with Jesus, you're going to die like that. I mean, very few people have a, have a, have a deathbed conversion. Very few people actually come to the place of recognizing Jesus as Savior. Someone wrote that when Timothy McVeigh, the guy that blew up the, the, the uh, um, government building in Oklahoma City, when he was being put to death, he said that he will join many in hell today. He didn't look into the, into the face of death and realized that he needed to be right with God. He went to death as angry and as spiteful to God as he lived. That's the way most people die. In fact, look on the other side of the cross of Jesus. Just take a look over there for a minute. That one will die the same as he lived in unbelief, in spite, and in hatred. If he said spiteful things to Jesus, it's not recorded, but I wonder how spiteful he became to the one who expressed faith. The salvation of the one of the criminals gives everyone hope so that people don't need to despair. I mean, until your last breath on earth, you can call out on the name of Jesus Christ unto salvation and you will be saved. Don't despair. You haven't cross the line yet. If you're listening to me, then you're still alive. But here's a second statement. Don't presume. Don't presume that if you get the chance to be on a deathbed and you can see your death coming, don't presume, number one, that you'll have that experience. And number two, don't presume that you'll make that choice then. Once again, the scriptures are clear. Paul quotes the Old Testament by saying, Today is the day of salvation. There's a third statement. I think one of the most difficult of all of the seven statements, frankly, because it seems so odd. <laughs> the Gospels tell us that the disciples had all fled, including Peter. 
There was only one disciple that was left at the cross, only one disciple who came with the women that day. You remember his name, the writer of the gospel that we were relating to, and that is John himself. Some have suggested that John the apostle may have been the youngest of all the apostles. Whether that would be true or not, I don't have any idea. Part of that was because of where he was positioned at the uh, at the uh, at the Passover meal. But whether he was the youngest or not, the, the the statement that's made of John is he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Do you remember yesterday we looked at John thirteen and it says having loved his own to the end. I mean, God so loved the world. I mean, God loves us. That's 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 a factual case. But there was some different level of love between Jesus and John. John went to the cross. He didn't flee like the rest. And while he was standing there, he was standing there with maybe one of the most forgotten people. Mary, Jesus' mother. Let me talk to you as mothers for just a minute. Do you have sons or even daughters? Can you imagine just for a minute how you would feel if your son or daughter was being put to death at the hands of angry, hateful people? Mary did. In fact, I, I tried to I try to think about what Mary must have been feeling and thinking. We don't have time. I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to get through all this, but oh, you need to go back because I think this statement is said in a very interesting context. In the context, even in John chapter 18, it is said that while they were crucifying, excuse me, in chapter 19, while they were crucifying him, it was said that the soldiers were parting out the garments of Jesus. He had five such garments. They had each given each one of them one of the five garments. Then there was this single tunic, this, this beautiful inner garment that would have been worn under everything else close to his, his skin. They were, they were playing games for that. Mary's eyes, I suspect, looked over because isn't it possible that she made that for him? In fact, Chuck Swindoll makes that very point. Chuck Swindoll would make the point that he thinks that that tunic was made by Mary and she was watching them argue about it and, and try to decide who would get it while her son was hanging on that cross. And so Jesus made a third statement, woman, Behold your son, son, behold your mother. You know, I don't think when he said mother, woman, excuse me, behold your son, I don't think he was asking her to look his way. I think he was asking her to look John's way. Oh, I, I, I gave so much thought to this particular one because I think that there are so many, so many levels going on here. Jesus, as a good Jew, knew the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and thy mother. For every child, there comes a point where obedience to their parents ends, but there's never a time in our life that we ever end honoring our parents. Here was Jesus dying for the loss of humanity, and yet he loved his mother enough to honor her and hand her over to John. See, Jesus knew at that point, right, none of his brothers and sisters were even believers. So he was concerned about where his mother would be going and who would take care of her. We all understand that Joseph had probably died years earlier. She was a widow. As the eldest son, Jesus would have been the one that needed to be in charge. Well, I'm sorry, I, I have four more to go and I don't have much time. We all understand what happened at noontime. The sun went dark. By the way, it wasn't an eclipse. I, I Again, liberal Bible scholars have 
searched and searched for maybe how it could have just been some natural phenomenon. It wasn't a natural phenomenon. It was a supernatural phenomenon. God, in essence, put his hand over the sun and darkened the world at that moment. High noon and the sun went dark. Not for a minute, not for 10 minutes, not for an hour, for three hours. The Gospels are very clear. And by the way, the only statement that's recorded by Matthew, the only statement recorded by Mark is number four. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Translated, of course, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quotation, of course, from Psalm 22, 1. David had some experience in his life where he could cry those words, but they were really prophetic. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Oh, by the way, isn't it interesting? Think about it. Father, forgive them. But when the sun went dark, Jesus didn't say, Father, why have you forsaken me? He said, God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, we don't have the time, nor the intelligence, nor the actually the understanding to ever delve into how did God forsake God. Jesus is the God man, 100% God, 100% man. That whole, that whole doctrine of the, of the um, incarnation, the kenosis as it's called, the, the theanthropic person. There's a couple of good big words for you. How did the father forsake the son? I don't know. I, I, honestly, I don't think anybody knows. And don't believe it if they say, I can describe that. No, they can't. No one can understand it. Why the father did it, we know why. Because it was at that point the transaction for sin was laid upon Jesus. Paul says it like this, he who knew no sin became sin for us. It would appear that at noontime is when the Father laid the punishment of sinners on the back, as it were, of Jesus. Jesus had to say the words, my God, my God. I mean, can there be a greater anguish? Can there be a greater pain? He had been rejected by his own family. He had been rejected by his disciples. He had been rejected by his own people. John said it like this. He came unto his own, but his own did not welcome him. They didn't receive him. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. I mean, he had known rejection all of his life. But now on the cross at high noon, the Father forsook him. I don't think there can be a greater mystery. I don't think there can be a greater, a, a greater um, trying to think about how that was. The time rolled on. I don't think it rolled on very quickly, frankly. But on went the time. Noon, dark. One, dark. Two, dark. And then it was almost three o'clock, the Gospels tell us. At almost three o'clock, Jesus made a statement. Now again, even Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani was probably closer to three than it was at noon. But I want you to focus with me on the final three words. Here was Jesus. He had suffered now for six hours on the cross, which really wasn't very long in the whole scope of things in the cross. But nevertheless, he had suffered for six hours. And John chapter 19 records these words, I thirst. The suffering had come to a point. Remember, he had rejected the gall and all of that in the early part, but now he says, I thirst. There's a little phrase that I want to make sure that I read in verse 28. Listen to this. It says, after this, listen, Jesus 
knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I'm thirsty. Did you hear that? Knowing that all things had been fulfilled, which had been written in the scriptures. I mean, if you ever think that Jesus had somehow lost consciousness due to the loss of blood, if you ever think somehow he had lost control of the situation, if you ever think that somehow man had authority over Jesus, forget that thought. It said, knowing all things had been fulfilled, he was in total control of this situation. That doesn't mean he wasn't in pain. It doesn't mean he didn't suffer. Do not misunderstand me. But do understand this. He was not murdered. No man took his life. That phrase by the Apostle John, knowing that all things were fulfilled, I thirst. You could go back to Psalm 69. We don't have any time left. It's, my time is way fast. Psalm 69, that's what is quoted in that passage. Every Jew that may have been standing around that cross, I believe, were hearing these words and they were, they were reflecting back on their scriptures. Psalm 22 and Psalm 69. And they, they were hearing the very words of their, of their prophets Then came the time. Six hours had passed. And now, very calmly, consciously, he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. It's finished. It's over. Everything was accomplished. Therefore, Jesus had received the sour wine, said, it is finished. Listen to the next phrase. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He bowed his head. You know what that means? If he bowed his head, it meant his head was still erect. It meant that, again, he wasn't some emaciated, just like lost all of his his faculties, it meant he was still in control and he knew that it was over. It is finished. Oh, could there be more, more uh, meaningful words coming from that cross? It's finished. Again, he wasn't some exhausted sufferer. But it's the seventh word recorded by Luke in chapter 23. Let me just turn there very quickly because I want you to hear in Luke chapter 23, he says, he says this in chapter 23. Uh, oh, yeah, chapter 23. Um, sorry. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I was in chapter 22. My, I, I, I knew either my, either I picked up the wrong Bible or something. I was in the wrong chapter. Look at chapter 23 and verse 46. Notice what it says, please. And Jesus whimpering with a silent voice. Is that what it says? That says in your Bible, you got a, you've got a perversion, not a version. No, it says, and Jesus crying out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He was in full control. Full control. He wanted everyone to hear. Cried out with a loud voice. Oh, oh, quickly. Okay, quickly, look at what he said. Father. Remember the first one? Father, forgive them. Remember the middle one? My God, my God. Look at the last one. Father. The relationship had been restored. The transaction had been complete. He who knew nor sin had become sin for us. He bore the penalty. He bore the, the, the pain of, of sin. He died on behalf of lost sinners. And now with his fellowship restored with his father, he said, Father, 
Into your hands I commit my spirit. His life wasn't taken from him. No one killed Jesus. He gave his life. He committed his life to his father. Often in his, in his earthly ministry, he would say things like this, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. Oh, he had such confidence in his father. All right, I need to wrap this up. I began by asking you to behold the man. I began by asking you to take some time to look away from whatever you've been doing and to look unto Jesus. But listen to me now. That's not enough for salvation. Just seeing Jesus, just beholding him, beholding him as the Lamb of God, beholding him as the man, beholding him as the king, as the, as the criminals looked and they beheld, as the people around the cross beheld, that wasn't enough for salvation. Some of you are going to behold Jesus. Some of you took time today to join us and, and to look at Jesus. Some of you might even take some time throughout the weekend to behold Jesus. You might go back and read the scriptures and behold him and see him. But here's the thing. Have you believed? Beholding is not enough. You must believe in him as your savior. That was the difference between the two criminals. The difference between the two criminals was the one beheld and the other believed. Oh, we can so often think that we would have done things so differently. There's a song that we have sung over the last few years. Let me read you some words and then I'm going to have to quit. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that we should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Now listen, behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice, call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath had brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give the answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. We're going to leave each other on this Good Friday. We leave with Jesus having been taken down from the cross, taken to an empty tomb, a stone rolled in front. The burial had not been completed. They hadn't done all that they needed to do. And so they had to wait on Saturday, the grief and the pain and the fear, all of it. Oh, wait a minute. It wasn't grief and pain and fear for everyone. There were a lot of people around Jerusalem who were having a party. They were sending gifts. They were thrilled that this one was finally done with. Nah, but someone said it many years ago. It's Friday. Say it with me. But Sunday's coming. Next time we join each other, it'll be for the sunrise service. On Sunday at 8 a.m., we're going to join each other with Zoom. We're going to get to see each other and hear each other. Because it's that day, the Resurrection Sunday, that is more important than even today. Oh, his death was absolutely essential for redemption. But without the resurrection, he's no different than every other dead religious leader. But Sunday, oh, Sunday, we get to rejoice in our risen Lord. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. I mean, again, you can imagine I could have gone on for hours if I really wanted, 
But we didn't need to do that. We just needed to be reminded of some things. So today, would you behold the man, but make sure that you're believing in him too. Let me pray and I'll let you go back to your day. Father, thank you. Thank you for the death that our Savior paid for our redemption. Cause us to think about what it all meant, how it all went. And Father, if there's anyone that's ever watched even a portion of this study today, if they aren't genuinely your child, oh, please draw them to your son. We'll go through the rest of our day and we'll get back to normal. And yet, Father, I pray that we will still think about it and may our hearts rejoice because we know what's coming on Sunday where we can gather to rejoice in the resurrection. Thank you for these times that we can be together. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining me again. I, I just am, I'm just so thrilled that you've been with us. We'll look forward to seeing you on Sunday at 8 o'clock, all right? And then 10 o'clock for the morning service. I think even though it's going to be a little different than any other Easter, we're going to make it as special as we can, all right? Thank you very much. We'll see you on Sunday.